Okay, so now we're live. Okay, so what today's meeting is for us to discuss uh, about uh, Code Blue. And Code Blue is an event that aims to teach first aid to using gamification principles. So using game design, we motivate people to learn first aid better. Okay, so I need you guys to remember that. Okay, what is Code Blue? Code Blue is an event that uses game design techniques uh, to to teach first aid. Okay, um, so. If you guys see the, the whole panel of people down here at the bottom, I'm not sure if you guys can see my mouse cursor. But the whole panel of people down here are my wonderful team members from Code Blue. Uh, they're all very shy, except for like one person eating around there. Uh, that's Ben. Yeah, say hi, Ben. Okay, so everyone else is too shy to show their face. Uh, okay, so basically what this, this workshop is about today is we're going to go through some of the basic gaming principles and how to use that to motivate other people. Okay, so I'm going to switch over the slides now. Um, Okay, in a second. Okay, can you guys can you guys see the, the screen share? Can I? Okay, so you guys can see the screen share. All right. Okay, so basically today we're going to go through um, gaming principles. All right, and uh, the purpose of, of gaming principles. Why why do we choose games in the first place? Um, games have a powerful uh, powerful tool to motivate people to learn first aid. Okay, so and first aid for us is a cause that resonates for all of us, and this is the reason why we are doing it in the first place. Um, games are a very useful way of, of getting people to do repetitive actions, which is an important thing in first aid. You know, to motivate them. So um, this this set of slides are based on several research papers as well as an online course by. Uh, some guy called, I can't remember his name, I'll, I'll remember it later. Okay, so um, the first thing that I need you guys to remember um, will be will be the self-determination theory. But before we dive into theory, right, okay, I need to, to get you guys to share with me. So I've asked my team members here to think of one game um, that, that, you know, appealed to them very greatly in the past. Okay, so... Uh, Whenever you guys are ready, you can share share about it. Just say the the, the game name uh, and in one sentence why it appealed to you. So Ben, do you want to start first? Since you're there, no, okay. So I'll just read out from from all the typing there. So anyone can start, okay. So, so Sing Sing, uh, which is this girl here, yeah, the only one in the picture. Uh, okay, she says Assassin's Creed. So why why do you think that Assassin's Creed is is appealing to you? Okay, everyone else start typing your answers also. I think I need to distract everyone while the typing goes on. Okay, so Sing Sing says that um, Assassin's Creed is a game that drew her in. And the major point is that even though there are many games that will like it, um, I assume that she means like, you know, all the stealth games and that kind of stuff. Um, she said that it's the first game that did it in such an uh, that did it in such an immersive atmosphere. Okay, so they did heavy research in the environment and history, uh, and for her that was a major pull of the atmosphere. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Later, as you think about the game, as we go through the course, I need you to think about a particular game that interested you as well. Um, and as we go through the different mechanics, the different mechanisms, you guys will be able to apply it to your own games, and you see you know how it comes into play. Uh, so, you know, Sing Sing also said that, you know, because the, the research was so heavy and, and it was well, did you learn actual, actual historic facts and figures from it also. And when you interact with the characters, uh, they are so well written that they come alive, you know. And so, at two points here, she talks about atmosphere as well as the people, the narrative, you're drawn into the story. Okay, so that's for Sing Sing. Anyone else? Okay, so while someone else is typing, you guys can type answers also, so we don't have to wait so long. Mm, anyone? Okay, so while, while, while you guys are typing, I'll share one for myself. Um, for me, I won't, I won't share a game, I'll share more of like um, a real life event. Okay, so because obviously gamification a lot of it is focused on online content right now. But um, for Code Blue, we're looking at something that's offline, something that's cheaper to do, uh, something that you know has um, direct results without relying on a lot of technology. Okay, so for me, um, I used to participate in, in first aid competitions, you know, and for the longest time that was like, you know, my my whole life. I, I know I didn't study 
I didn't do anything else but you know train first aid uh, and did my best to win now. And so the question is, you know, why why would anyone uh, be so obsessed about first aid? Um, for me, the reason why I was drawn into it is because of the the friends that were there. So you know, when you compete every day, uh, when you train every day, then you know you form friendships with the people around you. And you know, even though you're tired, you want to give up. Uh, you can't you can't uh, betray your friends, right? I mean, it's like yeah. So for me, even though the times were not that good, they were not that fun. A lot a lot of times, I didn't want to let leave my friends behind. Okay, so that's for me the social element of it. Okay, so Charlotte shared that um, she's going to share something from her, her her experience in orientation camp. Um, so there were dark games. Um, so this dark game, basically they went into a chalet and they started shooting each other in the dark with water guns and all that kind of stuff. So she said it was very exciting for them. Um, um, the dark, okay, the dark games, uh, they function a lot like the escape rooms that you have at escape or you know elsewhere in, on the island. Um, so um, she said what she liked was the problem solving effect of it. Um, and she said also that the, 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 the darkness added a lot to it. So there are two components here as well. Uh, there's problem solving element as well as the, the puzzle element, like Ben said, um, and as well as the you know the darkness. So again, comes in the the atmosphere comes in as well. Okay, so maybe we have just like one more person. Uh, uh, ben also adds on that you know there's a lot of of teamwork. Okay, and so uh, perhaps what Sing Sing says is that you know why the escape games are so popular is because they are challenging. Uh, you have there's the possibility of failure. Okay, so we're gonna touch on possibility of failure later as well. Okay, um, and finally the last one I think um, I'll talk I'll share about ECN's one. Then for the rest of you guys who haven't shared yet, just keep your game in mind. Okay, um, so ECN also sharing another orientation game um, called uh, it was called Friendship Night. So uh, she said what what made her enjoy the the game. She didn't really share much about what the game was. Uh, she basically said that you know it's the atmosphere and how it made people feel. So she said there's a lot of acting, you know, the people um, slapped each other, um, they shouted each other. You know, as they were watching the acting going on, they're more immersed into the storyline as well, and that was a big draw for her. Okay, so um, sorry if you have to you know look at me narrate everything now, but you know everyone's mic isn't working today. So hopefully uh, Ben, you can interact with me, uh, so you can see Ben's like you know bald head here now. He just shaved it recently. Okay, so okay, so the rest of you, so Ben, Muhaimin, um, uh, Hannah, and and Thaddeus, right? Just keep the game in mind, and for you guys watching as well, keep uh, your game in mind as well as we go into into the mechanics. Okay, so we're gonna switch back to slides now. Um, so the, it's very important for us to understand all these theories that I was sharing with you guys earlier. If we don't understand all these game theories, then there's no point in, in doing our event. Okay, so how is this relevant for everyone else? So the games, the keyword in game design is motivation. Okay, I'm sure you guys hear all the stories about how uh, people are addicted to games. You know, they would they would play all night, uh, day and night. Uh, they won't study, they won't do anything else, and they just join the game over and over again. Okay, for me, I had the experience also. I used to play uh, World of Warcraft. Uh, and I would play it more than I study. Um, and it was there were many World of Warcraft. I would say is one of the games which uses a lot of the mechanics very well. Okay, and so for me, maybe I'll use that as an example. Maybe I'll use I'll touch on some games that they shared earlier. Um, so Assassin's Creed and some orientation games as well. Okay, so the first thing that you guys need to understand about um, about game design or gamification. Okay, uh, gamification is essentially using game design techniques. Um, to apply to something that's not a game, okay? So it can be anything. For us, it's first aid. For you, it could be anything uh, else. It could be uh, to get that get people to buy drinks or whatever it is. Okay, so it's corporate or non-corporate uh, events. Okay, so um, gamification is not so much about using games and slapping them on. So it's very easy for us to say, you know, oh, I really love uh, Plants vs Zombie. Let's teach first aid by getting them to play Plants vs Zombie. Sure, that might be effective. Because of the novelty of the situation, but after a while, you know, people see through it, um, and you know, the effectiveness of your content is not so good. Okay, so um, we're going to talk about the first theory, which is the self-determination theory, uh, which is a theory about motivation. Okay, so um, for the guys, for you guys, the Cold Blue team, if you guys have any questions at any point in time, right, just uh, type out we will see. Okay, so this is only an interactive session. Okay, if you guys wanted a a, a lecture, then. Um, then it will be very boring for you guys. Okay, so make this interactive as much as possible. Okay, so the self-determination theory, I'm just going to boil it down to the three key points of it. Okay, so self-determination theory states that a person is most motivated um, into doing something when the task involves these three 
elements. So competence, relatedness, and autonomy. Okay, so competence just basically mean, uh, means how able the person is at doing a task. Okay, so if let's say someone's not competent at something, so for example, if I ask, if I task Ben to, 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 to write a, a thesis on advanced mathematics right now, chances are he won't be very motivated to do it because, you know, he's not competent to do that, you know, and if you face with a task that's so difficult, um, chances are you won't do it, right? Okay, so the next thing is relatedness. Uh, relatedness basically um, is, is the social element of motivation. We want to feel that we belong somewhere. So if let's say you are, you are getting, giving someone a task, but if you all alone, uh, the motivation to do the task will be much less. Whereas on the flip side, so like I shared in my example earlier, um, why I, I, I you know trained so hard at first is because my friends were there. I felt a sense of belonging. Okay, so the last point is autonomy. Autonomy, you know, everyone else out there wants to have a sense that you know they're in control of their own lives. And you know, if let's say you have a boss who dicta dictates everything. Um, to you. So for example, you're doing a project um, and you have this guy who micromanages manages everything you do. Everything from the, the way you type your email, the, the types of SMS you send out, SMSs you send out, you feel more, nothing more than a puppet. Okay? So on the flip side, if you have someone who motivates you, uh, who's very inspiring, chances are they'll give you free reign to do what's within your scope as well. So they'll allow you to do things that are within your competence range. They'll make you feel welcome and related and they'll let you have your, your choice of doing what you want to do as well. Okay, so these are the three things, and you'll notice a lot of game elements um, touch just on these three things, and this is not just related to, to games, okay, so you can use it in real life as well. So a lot of the team members, actually all the team members here are all medical students, so you know, when you guys come into, you know, like go to the clinics or you see your patients, a lot of them are more willing to listen uh, to, your, to your advice if you touch on these things three things. Okay, so if you guys want, you can read up um, on Wikipedia, just search self-determination theory. Okay, so, um, okay, let's get this slide. Okay, so, obviously there, there looks like there are a lot of words here, but I'm not going to read everything. Okay, so, um, so basically what are games? Games are effective tools for enhancing, oh my goodness, are effective tools for enhancing learning and understanding complex subject factors. So people have done research and shown that, you know, that games are effective. Okay, however, there are there's the risk. There's always the risk of designing instructional games that neither instruct nor engage people. Um, and I'm sure you guys can think of many. You know, if you guys have gone through the school system, you guys have played many many games. You know, they try to teach you what history or math or whatever, and you have some uh, stupid flash figure running around the screen. Okay, so if you have games that are not fun, they don't engage, and they do not instruct people, then the value of the game is is uh, not there. And in some cases, also it turns people away from the subject matter as well. Okay, so this is one very important point that I need to stress you guys. Stress to you guys, okay? So the general accept, accepted position is that games themselves are not sufficient for learning. Okay, so the point that we cannot use games on block, okay? But there are uh, not elements that there are elements of games that can be activated. Okay, so for the guys on Coblu team, you guys need to come around to understand this uh, paradigm shift. Okay, we are using game elements. We're not using games. Okay, so now I need you guys to pause and stop. Okay, and think. You know. Um, with whatever project you're doing, you need to ask yourself what is your, the ideal end state you want your participants to have. So for the Coblu members, um, what what are some qualities of an ideal first aider or, or someone who plays our event? Um, who would that be? So think on it, and, and you know, just say out the first thing that comes to your mind. So I'll start the ball rolling. For me, uh, the ideal end state is someone who who continues practicing first aid and enjoys it at home. And he's willing to boast to his friends about his skill. Okay, so can maybe we'll get like two or three people share. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. For, for me, like, um, I guess the ideal end state would be just an open a mind that's like open to to learning more about first aid, la, Like, okay, like it's a bit like what you said, but I I, I don't I don't really um I'm not really sure if like it's practical to. Uh, to hope for everyone to be able to uh, to hope for everyone who takes part in, uh, in Code Blue to be able to uh, you know uh, actively practice their first aid um, mm. because um, I mean thinking from the, from the perspective of a lay person it's, it's, it may be a bit difficult to do that uh. mm -hmm. so as long as we get uh, the idea in their head that uh, first aid is something that you know is worth learning and it, and that we open their minds to the idea of yeah getting more training for first aid I think that that's the that's the main aim we should be targeting towards. Huh? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, oh, oh. Uh, mm. 
Yeah. Oh, go on. Go on, go on. Oh, okay. Yeah, regarding the yeah the, the three points you made just now about the, the games, like uh, what, what are the three points? Competence, relatedness, and autonomy. Yeah, the thing about thing about like our project in particular is because we're, we're trying to uh, the, the kind of uh, yeah we're, we're designing games with the with the with the um, you know the intention of bringing across a certain message to to the people. So it's not uh, in, in a way it's very different from the kind of games that are designed in the industry in the gaming industry. Like they, they, there's no purpose per se. The purpose is to have fun, but then mm. our purpose is to educate. So I mean, if we were to add in like one more one more uh, point to that um, th those three. Uh, Mm. Those three points, I, I think we need to consider like the relevance of what we do, la. Like, Okay. Yeah. So you know, there's the CRA, competence, relatedness, autonomy, and that's also mm. relevance. So I think the challenge is not so much to come up with something that is competent, that that, that, that you know uh, engages the competence and makes it uh, you know relevant and, uh, uh, and makes it um, you know related and autonomy or whatever. I think mm. the main issue is to make a game that is. Relevant and that, that will bring across the message just as effectively as a, a, a one-year course on first year would. And mm. uh, yeah, like the challenge there. Is, uh, so because of that, I think we got to look at the perspective of like um, look from the perspective of like uh, yeah, games outside of the typical you know gaming industry la. Like mm. okay, I think CC's point about like the uh, Assassin's Creed was quite quite uh, quite an interesting one because. Even though they weren't aiming at, you know, uh, educating, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure about this. I don't actually play the game, but I, my impression is that the game is meant for fun only. They didn't mm. intend on teaching uh, people about history, but they did a lot of research into it, and it, you know, it became a, yeah, it was a very good outcome la, that uh, was not um, intended la, at first. Mm. Yeah, so um, uh, although it's a bit different from what we're doing, I think I think it's a, yeah, it's probably worth looking into that, that direction la. but then again the challenge is to make is to like you know think of how we can make a game that is playable uh, mm. in person not a computer game uh, something that's cheaper uh, mm. yeah okay but I mean I can I can share about that later la. I had a I had a game in mind that I think may be a bit uh, similar to that, that okay sure, sure. Uh, we will get back to your, your game in a while yeah. Uh, so, uh, Thaddeus brought up a good point about, you know, um, if, let, what, if let's say we're using this for the purpose of teaching something, we have an extra motive, okay, uh, other than fun unto itself, okay, then how do we achieve this goal? How do we reconcile it with the, the three uh, points of the self-determination theory? So, I'll get to that in a short while. Um, but now, Sing Sing and Ben would like to share something. So, Sing Sing shares that the ideal would be someone who people can trust to handle first aid situations comfortably. Uh, Whereas Ben says that he wants first aiders who are excited about the event that has pe that about the event and people feel like they're coming back. Oh Ben, you can speak, right? You can speak. Go ahead and speak. You don't have to monologue. Okay, the camera's on you now. He's very tired. Okay, now I will just show your face and then I'll mime it out for you. Okay, so Ben said that um, he wants people uh, who are excited about the event and they feel like coming back. And they feel that people should recommend, and and people feel that they should recommend it to more people. Okay, so those were the two ideal states that uh, Ben and Sing Sing wants. Okay, so let's come back to the point that that um, that just made made about you know the extra motive. Um, we're coming back to self determination theory. Okay, so um, his point was that you know um, the games out there, the current gaming industry um, designs games for the purpose of having fun. Okay, so um, we have to look um, beyond regular games in the industry. Okay, so if you look at, at um, let me give you an example of an ulterior motive that game designers would have in the game industry. How about um, earning money? Okay, earning money I would say would be their ulterior motive um, or their, their main motive in a sense. People who go into the industry, I wouldn't say that they're, okay, maybe some of them would want to design games for the sake of have, letting other people have fun, but not uh, that, that would not apply to a huge group of people who are in it to earn money. Okay, sure. Um, okay, so how do they? How how does the the fact that they have an extra motive uh, tie in the fact that you know they need to create fun? Okay, so gamification is an industry which which um, applies game uh, mechanics and game design. Uh, uh, what called game design? Okay, I can't find a word for it. Okay, let me restart again. Um, okay, sorry. Uh, that is maybe you want to share about your game first before I, I continue. Oh, okay. 
Yeah, so uh, the game I have in mind is, is this thing called Life Game. Uh, it's done by a... It's actually a... Okay, I'm not sure if any of you have taken part in it before, but this one is a part of a, it's a Christian initiative. And, uh, and that, um, I think um, uh, so there's this a person from some church, I can't remember who he is, but he designed a game basically intended to uh, uh, um, like uh, preach the gospel. Uh, I mean, okay, the reason I use this game uh, is because um, this is something that is played uh, in person. Like you move around in, in, a, in a hall or in a certain setting. With some props lying around and stuff, and then you, yeah, okay, like The only downside to this is, is it was a game that was played over three days, lah. But the idea of it was to um, use uh, uh, this kind of game, uh, which you know you, you can actively participate in, to bring across a, a specific idea, la, a specific uh, set of uh, uh, yeah, la, ideas that, uh, and I thought I thought it was quite effective because um, because I, I took part in the game myself and. It was something that uh, that uh, you know managed to drive in drive in certain concepts and certain uh, uh, you know ideas lah that that um, in a very interesting way in a way that that was uh, non uh, not not very um, uh, matter of fact it was something that was um, yeah that was able to uh, get people to uh, like pick up things at their own pace, pick up ideas and pick up uh, concepts at their own pace. So mm. if we were to say, okay, so maybe I just I just give, give a brief run through of like how, how it's done. Uh. So basically, okay, the idea of the game, the idea that I wanted to bring across was that uh, yeah, uh, um, uh, certain uh, memory verses in the Bible, certain uh, certain concepts about about the Christian faith, like uh, who is God uh, what, and, um, and so on. Uh. And how they did it was that, um, okay, there was a, uh, there was um there were those there was like some mini games and uh, those mini games were in were um so, sort of like content based like, like we had to uh, we had to like uh, you know me say memorize a certain set of uh, verses to uh, to get past those mini games to win those mini games and using the credits we win from those mini games we can move on with the big game which is uh, a live game la. so basically how it's done is that we take on roles. And responsibilities of like like okay like like people in real life like like say I would take on the role of a police officer, someone else would take on the role of a judge in court, someone else would take the role of a, 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 a teacher in school and stuff like that. So it's it's kind of like a role playing game, and it it it, 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 it makes people you know interact as as we go along. So uh, I mean like okay so. Uh, at the start of the game, we all start out as, as like babies and all that, lah. Okay, yeah, yeah, it's quite a long game, so yeah, just bear with me for. A while. We start out as babies, and then we have to like educate ourselves, right? So how do we educate ourselves? We, we, we use puzzles. So those puzzles, uh, in order to solve those puzzles, we had to memorize a certain set of verses and stuff, and then we tried to, yeah, yeah, no problem. Okay, so, okay, so we had to. And try and memorize the set of verses to get past those puzzles, and then after we, you know, earn credits on those puzzles, we will be able to use those credits to buy points in, buy points in life or something like that. Like, then as we climb up the ranks, we become like uh, someone becomes a uh, doctor, or someone becomes a lawyer or something like that. If you earn less points, then you become a a bank. Uh, okay, I shouldn't say that. Okay, if you earn less points, then you you become something else. Like. Then um, yeah. So moving on from there, we uh, yeah like, we. Uh, we 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 just uh, you know keep on playing again. Right? It's a, it's more like a role playing game. Yeah. So there's elements of everything. It, it, it's uh it, you, you don't okay you you're you're competent in the sense that you don't have to know much before you start playing it, right? So yeah, uh, it's it's easy for you to get like, It's easy for you to take part. Yeah. And um it's it's uh, related in a way because uh, you know we. We have to socialize as we as we carry on with the game. We have to mix around with people, and uh, and every element of the game is somehow related to every other element. Yeah, so they're all interlinked. Yeah, it's uh yeah, okay lah. Then I mean, of course, you have the autonomy to take your time and everything lah. And most of all, it's relevant because it, it by playing a game in this way, it, it causes people to have to learn uh, certain key concepts lah. Yeah. And and if we say apply it to first aid, we uh, if if we were to be able to like uh, adopt this uh, idea uh, we would be able to you know let the participants uh, use these concepts uh, actively as they're playing on playing with the game, yeah, and in a continuous manner like you have to move from task to task.
Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's not. I mean, like compared to super game, super bear games, it would be a bit mm. more like um, of a longer term thing, and 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 that would cause them to be able to, I guess learn more lah. Okay. Have it internalized better. Yeah, I can. Okay. 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 Uh, thanks for sharing that. Is okay. So, um, I think that the, the game example that you shared was a very good example of of a lot of game mechanics, uh, game mechanics coming to play, and you can see a lot of the elements in self determination theory, as you rightfully said. Um, so just now you raised the point about you know something about you know uh, if we're looking at this one, if this is first aid, you know we can't use some of the things. You know what what was the point that you were saying again? I'm sorry. Could you because just now previously you said something about. Um, if let's say we're using this for first aid, maybe you should focus on making it uh, related or relevant or something. What, what was the point that, that you're saying? Oh, oh, okay. No, as in like when I was thinking about like the three aspects of the, okay, oh, whatever, whatever that was the, the, the yeah, the competence. Uh, mm. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, I I just thought that that would, that applied to like you know those mainstream games where the main mm. aim was to have fun uh, and and if we were to you know come up with a game related to teaching first aid I mean it is important to consider the relevance of everything we're doing yeah that that, that that's basically the point I'm trying to make okay so yeah uh, relevance in the sense of oh you could elaborate about that yeah as in uh we we can't afford to like drift off too much to mm. you know uh games just for the fun of it. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's a, education, yeah. that's an excellent point. That's an excellent point. Okay, so um, it okay, we'll touch on on that point uh, later. Okay, but basically, let's come back to what what uh, Thaddeus shared. And I, I thanks for, for sharing again. So if we look at the self self determination theory again, competence, autonomy, and relatedness. Okay, these three, three things you must drill into your head. Unfortunately, like most of you guys can't speak on your mic right now, so uh, you can like you know type it in the chat and then you like memorize it. So I need you to memorize it. Okay, competence, relatedness, autonomy, and again that Ben uh, that Thaddeus shared was an exa- ex- excellent example of a, g- a game touching all these three points. Okay, so competence, the person came into the game. Um, okay, so maybe um, that is your example of, of you know competence. Uh, you know everyone didn't really need to have some skill set to come to the game uh, was relevant. But perhaps the more important thing is everyone came to the game as a baby. So the fact that you had to progress from a baby to a doctor, so on and so forth, meant that there was some kind of leveling up system, some kind of progression. They didn't throw you into the deep end and say, you know, here are a thousand uh, things for you to memorize. Go ahead and do it. You had to start from somewhere low. So as you build up your confidence, you know, what are you building up? You're building up your perception of competence. Okay, so a lot of the, the thing that I didn't mention is that in the self-determination theory, it's not the truth of the matter. So that means you don't have to be truly competent. You don't have to be truly related to the whole world um, or you don't have to be truly autonomous. It's your perception of these things. So as you come in as a baby and as you level up, you have the perception that you are competent. You are related because you are related to all your friends around. And of course, because you give a spiritual example, relatedness also talks about you know your connection to the overlying cause. So for people who are doing volunteering causes out there, you know, um, or spiritual stuff, you know, you feel uh, relevant. This is relevant to 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 what I'm doing. So coming back, that comes to the point of your of relevance. So you know, one problem that we had from our trial runs before um, was that you know we couldn't find a way to trade off the games. And the uh, and the content that we're trying to teach. So the problem that we face came about because we use games on block. Uh, we didn't we didn't think about you know what do we want to teach in the first place, or what do we want to achieve. Uh, we started by saying these are the games that we have. Let's slap on some of our instructional methods onto it. Okay, and so that was less effective. All right, so that's enough for the self determination theory. Do um, you guys have anything to say about it? If not, we'll just uh, move on first. Okay, so anytime you're just try to just type at the corner at the chat bar and I'll read it out. Okay, so um, let's keep going. All this uh, research, 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 blah blah blah. Who cares? Okay, so this is a very important slide. Okay, so you can see on your screen now. Um, it's called. It's one of the the models that people have suggested for how games work. Okay, so if let's say you were uh, designing a normal game, right? What would you have? Basically, you would have this cycle. Okay, I just deleted the, the part about uh, about um, instructional content. Okay, so let's let's make it simple first. Let's remove the instructional content for the time. Okay, so if let's say I'm designing a game uh, for the mass media for people to have fun for for me to earn money. Okay, so basically what happens is on the input side of things, I need to put in some game characteristics. What do that? What does that mean? So for example, if let's say I want the game world to be highly immersive and exciting then my game characteristics must come through and you know in creating my game I must put all these game characteristics in so all these game characteristics and goes into the game cycle which is where the player comes in 
Okay, so as the player comes in, okay, so he starts from a uh, user judgment. Let's say I'm playing uh, World of Warcraft, okay, and the first time I log in, um, I see a beautiful uh, screen of, 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 of like what elves and orcs or whatever it is, and I say, you know, this is amazing, I love it. So that's a judgment I've made, okay, I love the look of this game, that's my judgment. And because I've made a judgment on the game, I would follow up with a behavior. If I like this game and I like, like what I see, chances are I'll continue clicking on, right? I'll click on the button and say, you know, I want to create a character, I want to do my first level uh, level up, okay? And the system gives, uh, and they give the system a feedback. So in the form of feedback in this case is that they click the button, they create a character, and those people are tracking it, can see, oh, okay, someone new just joined our service, okay? And this system feedback leads people to do more judge, uh, leads people to, to, to create more judgments and create more behavior. So after I log into the game, what happens? I see my op, or whatever it is, and I kill my first spider, and suddenly, descending from the sky, this golden beam of light hits me because I just leveled up. It was easy. So I've made this judgment. You know, I love this sensation of leveling up. And so the behavior that I do is, you know, I'm going to continue playing some more so I get more of those levels, and I get I get feedback on it, and I keep creating judgments. So do you get, guys understand the game cycle? Does it, does it make sense? Okay, so it makes sense. So basically what happens, okay, so most of the time in games, what they try to do is keep you within the cycle. Why? Because the more judgments, behaviors, and feedbacks that you make, um, the more likely you are to spend time and money on the game. Okay, so you have all those all those um, popular games now, you know, like Candy Crush, you know, they try to keep you, keep you interested, make, give you judgments to make, you follow up with a behavior, and give you a feedback. So the first time, let's say I used, uh, I don't know what people use in Candy Crush, you know, you press like the special suite or whatever, you pay like one dollar or something like that. Then after the system says like, you know, wow, you won the game or something, you won this level that you've been fighting on for so long. So you make a judgment, okay, so now I say, you know, this is really useful, I enjoy doing it, so I'm going to continue buying more of these things. And the system keeps feeding you into the cycle. And this is where um, normal games would differ from instructional games, okay? So the next step is, after you come through this game cycle, you must um, you must have a debriefing stage, okay? So this is very important, okay? So debriefing is a very important uh, tool of, of instructional games, and you come up to your learning outcomes. So um, the instructional content also comes in together with your game characteristics. So you see, these are two equal halves of your input skill. If you're missing one or the other, you're either going to create a game, or you're going to create a boring lecture. Okay, so you must have equal uh, equal parts of instructional content and game characteristics. And the game cycle drives people to do things. And why it's called a cycle is because you want people to be motivated to keep doing things. The ideal scenario, if let's say we use the example for first aiders, right? The ideal scenario I would say is, you know, if let's say someone comes for the event and they're very motivated, you know, we give them the, the judgment that, you know, as they do CPR and they see, oh, I won a prize. And the judgment is, you know, um, first aid is something that I enjoy. And so their behavior, what could their likely behavior this, uh, be? They could sign up for another um, course, a formal course to get a certification. And then after they get a certification, they get another feedback. Okay, so that's looking at a very big scale. If you look at small games, so what we should try to do in our games is also always to give people good judgments, give them the means to do, create, carry out behavior, as well as to give them feedback. So these three elements should be present, as well as the debriefing and leading to learning outcomes. Okay, so do you have any questions about this? Um, this game cycle thing. No? Okay, so we'll move on, okay? So um, now we're going to go into the nitty-gritty of, of the games, okay? It looks like a lot now here, six different game characteristics, um, and this was, was suggested by one of the papers out there. So um, if you guys are interested, there are a lot of papers, uh, scientific papers on game design. So most of them are like, you know, um, psychology, sociology, all kinds of different things. So if you're interested, you can take a look at it. Okay, so basically this paper suggests six different um, six different things that someone must have in order, uh, in, a, in a game, in order for, for them to feel that it is a game. Okay, so the first one is fantasy. Going back to Assassin, the Sing Sing's example of Assassin's Creed, uh, a person is put into an imaginary or fantasy context with a lot of characters and themes. Okay, so uh, the the immersion of people into a fantasy game is often a big part of what what um of what makes a game a game. Okay, so let's use the example of football. Okay, so there's this concept called the magic circle. Okay, so let me create a new slide. Here. You know, the magic circle. So this concept basically says that in a game, all games are like a magic circle. You draw a circle on the ground, and anyone who enters it agrees to suspend any any idea uh, they have of the outside world. Okay, so I can't change the color. I don't know how to change the color. This um, they suspend the idea of the outside world. 
So basically, they say, okay, so now on the outside, I have my own rules and and different things. Okay, so I have to go to work, I have to get a degree, I have to get I have to get a job, I have to earn money. Okay, but once they step into this world, suddenly a new set of rules apply. This magic circle. So let's say we're playing football. Since when in the real world uh, is there a rule saying that you can't you can't pick up a ball with your hand? Obviously, you can pick up a ball with your hand. But once you enter this circle and everyone comes in with the agreement that we're entering this um, special zone, um, that's what makes a game a game. Uh, because everyone uh, has suspended their previous rules and have taken on a new rule, and a lot of, and a big part of encouraging people to enter the magic circle is to create for them a fantasy world, and this fantasy world can be through different things. It could be your plot, it could be your characters, it could be the design of your game. Okay, so if we look at a real life example, for example, uh, one easy way of getting people involved is to isolate them. So, for example, Thaddeus shared his game was played over three days. So you are isolating people from the outside world. Uh, I would assume that that is your, your game was held at some kind of camp. Yep. Yep. So camps are an excellent example of of ways in which people create a fantasy world. Now you are in a new environment, you are a new social status, um, and you're a new social environment, and therefore new rules apply, and you are more open to to taking on uh, the rules and the objectives of the game. Okay. So I hope that one made sense. The next thing, since we talk about rules and goals, games must have clear rules and goals. Imagine if you you if you played a game of soccer and there were no rules, okay? Obviously, no one would want to play the game. Okay, how do you win the game? How do you lose the game? No one, no one cares. They're just kicking the ball around. And this is the point where I must stress that you know games do not equal fun. Okay, does that make sense? I could have a game, uh, and games. Some some people will argue that they're defined as um, a set of rules, um, set of rules and objectives. Um, so I can play a game. But it, can, it couldn't. It doesn't necessarily have to be fun. Okay, that, I hope that one that part makes sense. But rules and goals are essential element of, of of games. So, despite all these points I'm making here, even if you add all six points inside your game, it will, isn't something that will make your game fun by itself. So you have to. Uh, there's another point that we'll come to later. How do you inject fun into your game? Okay, so rules and goals are obviously very straightforward. If you have no win state, why should people suspend their own rules? They can do anything they want in the game. Correct. Okay, so this is another thing related to the magic circle. The third thing is the sensory stimuli. Okay, so dramatic or novel visual and auditory stimuli. You know how a lot of people um, in the gaming industry spend millions of dollars designing uh, cutting edge techno uh, cutting edge uh, worlds, characters, and graphics, correct? Okay, so um, the, the stimuli is something that you know we have an instinctive need for, something that's different. It helps us immerse ourselves into the game world. Okay, so um, just to try something, okay, I need you guys to imagine your head. Um, that you are you're walking along the street and you see a small little kid uh, on the side of the road and in her hands she's holding a huge lemon slice. You take the lemon slice from her and you stick it in your mouth and chew on it and you can feel the juice dripping down your throat and it's extremely sour. Yeah, okay, I hope you guys I hope that worked for you guys because I've never tried that before. If things went right, right, um, you should be salivating. Uh, at an increased rate at that moment. So, you know, sensory stimuli, oftentimes we focus on. Okay, did anyone salivate? I hope that works. <laughs> no? <laughs> okay, please. Okay, yeah, ben, ben is salivating a lot over there. <laughs> okay, so, um, yeah, so in, in, compu on, in computer games, they can focus on sound and, and, and visuals only. But what we, uh, we have an advantage in the real world is that we can touch out to all five senses, you can reach out to smell, you can reach out to sound, you can reach out to sight. Okay, so that's something that we have to keep in mind as well. Make your games uh, visually tactile, uh, visually, uh, okay, I can't think, okay, make it exciting, okay, and make it exciting for all five senses. If you just focus on something that looks nice to the eye and smells like crap, no one's going to play a game, okay? So that's another point um, that you take my take in note as well, okay? So um, fourth point is challenge, okay? So just know someone uh, Sing Sing and 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 um, Charlotte shared about the shared about um, what do you call it um, their their orientation game um, and the orientation game was was basically people in an escape room and part of the fun of the escape room is you can fail okay so if let's say you, you play a game that you confirm win every time the chances are people will not play it after the first time they probably wouldn't even want to, to play it in the first place because it's so easy uh, it is it, it bores them okay and with, uh, there's this this um, psychologist called I can't pronounce his name. You guys will see how it's spelled later, but it's Mikhail Six Sixum. Ah, forget it. Okay, so basically, this psychologist states that that um that the optimal state 
a person can be in doing something and their motivation is when they are in a state of flow. And how do you enter the state of flow is when a task is between two extremes. Uh, one end, you have something that's so easy that it bores people, and on the other end, it's so difficult that it turns people off. Here's where you can see the tie-in of the self-determination theory again. Competence is a huge part of this. If you can feel that it's too easy for you, you'll be bored, you won't play. Um, if it's too difficult, you feel that your competence is being infringed upon, and therefore you won't play as well. Whereas, uh, so therefore, is to instill a form of into the game as well. Okay, so that's something that you must have an optimal level of difficulty and uncertain goal attainment. So uh, Charlotte and Sing Sing, thank you for sharing about the escape game just now. Next thing is mystery. Okay, so it just states that optimal level of informational complexity. So basically it just means that you know it can't be so straightforward. It's very similar to challenge as well. Okay, the last one is control. Okay, so control, basically people must have the perception of control. So like I told you guys earlier on uh, in our earlier meetings, um, we must give people the illusion of choice even if we can't give them the full uh, spectrum of choice. Okay, so the illusion of choice is a very powerful tool and again tying in to the um, self-determination theory again on if let's say people feel that you know they are working walking on a linear path, uh, they will be less motivated to play the games. Okay, and you can see the trend in games nowadays. You know, people are always saying like, oh, we are creating a brand new game with a whole whole new world, like Grand Theft Auto or Assassin's Creed. You know, you can explore the whole wide world. You don't have to do your single task. You don't have to do a single quest. You can choose whatever quest you want to do. And control comes. Okay, uh, Ben mentioned Watch Dogs, and I think Watch Dogs is a great example of, you know, open world. There's like Batman, Arkham Asylum, or whatever it is. I don't know what the latest game is. Uh, I wish I had time to play all these games. But basically, control is a big part of games as well. Okay? So, I hope you guys understood. So, obviously, I'm not going to talk about all this nonsense. So many slides. Forget it, you can slowly read it yourself, okay? Screw it. Uh, skip, 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 skip. Okay, so now we're back to this game cycle thing again. Again, I, again just to run through it again, you have instructional content, game characteristics, entering into the game cycle, and that's where you want your learners to be. And you take them out of the game, the game cycle to teach them the learning outcomes. Okay, so um, this is a very similar uh, similar uh, model, which talks about motivation, action, and feedback. Um, so you see it's very similar. Feedback, behavior, judgments. Okay, so basically people gain motivation uh, because of the judgments that uh, the judgments that they make. So motivation can be replaced with judgments, action, uh, is their behaviors, and then they get feedback. Okay, so this is something that's very, very important. If you don't have it, okay, it's called an engagement loop. If you don't have this loop, uh, people are going to lose motivation, they're not going to be engaged, and they're going to stop playing. And how then can you convey your instructional message? Okay, so that's something to keep in mind. Okay, uh, the next there are two kinds of loops. So you have engagement loops, and the next one is progression loops. So engagement loops are something that keeps going on and on and on. Okay, so I'm not sure if you guys play Maple Story yet. Okay, so Maple Story, um, your engagement loop is you know you kill one monster, you gain some experience points, um, and so okay, so you did action. The game says, okay, good job. I'm gonna award you with 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 experience points, and therefore you made a judgment on it. Okay, I love getting experience points. I love leveling up, so I'm gonna keep doing it over and over again. So that is an engagement loop. Okay, so the action is I kill the monster. Feedback is I got experience points, and my motivation is generated, and I'm gonna continue doing the action over and over. So that keeps you that you know this is the minuscule primary level of engagement. Next step, the next loop that that reaches out over the whole game is called the progression loop. Okay, and so basically it's very simple. You can see you start from what I call onboarding. If you can think about plants versus zombie, okay, in plants versus zombie, uh, you start with a tutorial level with one lane, okay, and there's no way that you can lose that that level because you just plant one plant there and you win the game. Okay, so onboarding is something that you know people start off. It's very easy, um, and so the game continues on in difficulty. Okay, so you have games that are, you have levels which are progressively harder, and there's a short rest, and it gets even harder. So along the way, you find that you're in a boss fight. And games get progressively more and more difficult. So essentially, what this this game, uh, what this loop is talking about is that you know, in order for you to be successful in doing, uh, in in achieving your goals, in creating an uh, effective game, people must feel like they are leveling up in life. Okay, uh, you must have your progression loops. If you don't have a progression loop, you don't have a clear end point at the top. Then people are gonna feel like you know, I'm not getting better at this. Okay, how does this relate to our game? Uh, so in essence, if let's say we do not have our progression groups, you know, people start from the first game and up to the last game, they're still at the same level of mastery. One, obviously, we haven't achieved anything, and second, they're gonna feel like you know, oh, I am so useless. I have no, I'm not competent in first aid, and chances are they will not continue the action. Okay, I hope that makes sense. Okay, so this is like uh, another way of looking at it. So this is like you know, start and overarching, and you have like, little bumps along the way. Okay, and uh, that's not very important. Okay, user judgments, blah 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 blah. Okay, so this is the thing I was talking about: conditions for flow, optimal levels of of uh, of difficulty, 
and uncertainty as well. So you must have clear goals, you must balance it must be a balance between perceived challenges and perceived skills. So that means you can't be so difficult that you're you know you can't achieve it. Okay. And you must have clear and immediate feedback. And this is something that's very important. A lot of times games we do do not have clear and immediate feedback. Uh, uh, let me share an example. Yeah. If you guys have heard of LinkedIn before? Okay, so LinkedIn is this this website that allows you to create your professional profile for other people to see. And a big part of, of LinkedIn is you must create you must complete your entire profile um, so that um, other people will be able to better assess you. Um, oh, sorry, Mohammed, I didn't I didn't see that. I'll, I'll talk about your point in a while. Okay, um, a big point about about um, LinkedIn is that you must create create your profile. Um, and a lot of people were not doing it because it's a tedious task. You fill it form after form after form. So how how do they increase um, their their success rates? It was simple. All they did was put a progress bar at the top, and suddenly saw a huge increase in number of people because people were getting immediate feedback. All of us love feedback. Okay, so uh, let me read what Muhammad said. Um, so Muhammad says, actually, what you mentioned about the magic circle in Assassin's Creed immersion can be used to such a great effect that we can make a compelling story and an environment that the players will be motivated to learn first aid, not just because they are themselves they themselves are interested in first aid, but it's because they are in a world we have created. To really want to save uh, the game characters, their friends, if they learn it well. Yes, and that's a great, a great point that Mohamed has made. Um, immersion is the suspension of your your real world, uh, real world beliefs and and, and um, rules. And you know, a really good game involves you with the characters, involves you the world. You know, uh, I haven't played any good games recently, but you know, I've been reading like what, what's the book called? Um, game of Thrones. So you know. The, the book drew me in. So basically, there's a magic circle. They made me feel connected to the characters and the world in it. And you know, when someone dies, that's when you know you feel a real emotional impact. Obviously, if someone wrote like you know, um, let's say I'm going to tell you guys now. Oh, um, this character, I have this character called uh, 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 Benjamin, and he's dead. Sorry. Okay, you guys are not going to feel an emotional pull for it. But because they created this uh, immersive world. Um, people feel a connection to it. So thanks, Mohamed, for sharing that. Um, and that's something that we should all endeavor to do. You know, if let's say you create a game where where people do not feel motivated to follow the rules of your game or the or the goals of your game, then you know chances are they're not going to benefit from the game as well. Okay, so immersion is a huge mechanic that we have to take into consideration. Okay, thanks, Mohamed, for sharing. Okay, let's go back to the screen share. Okay, so uh, this is the flow. You see, this the graph is very easy. So difficulty over time. Um, if something is too easy, um, so uh, if it's too easy, you'll be bored. If it's too difficult, there'll be anxiety. And this is the state of flow. So you must try to find a way to put your games in such a way that it's within this channel. And you notice that the graph is moving upwards, which means the game has to get progressively more difficult over time. And that comes in together with the same graph earlier, progression. Okay, it's tying all beautifully together, right? Okay, let's take a short breather. Does anyone have any questions? Are you guys feeling bored? You can say yes if you want. No? Okay, so Ben Ben's shaking his head. I'm not sure if you guys can see it. Okay, so okay. Okay, I catch my breath. Okay, at, at this point, does anyone want to, to ask any questions about the, the previous point we've made? So so far we've covered the self-determination theory. We've talked about um, the game cycle. We've talked about the six elements of games as well. Okay? All right. Okay, so we can continue on. Whew. Okay, well, we are more than halfway done actually. Okay, so we can skip past all this nonsense first. Um, if you guys want, you can read the slides. Those are just like quotes from different books. Um, all right. Okay, so and actually, this is something that's very interesting for me. Um, behaviorism yeah, in gamification. Okay, so gamification. A lot of people like to dismiss it as you know, um, it's not a scientific field of study. It's not not interesting. Um, there's no, there's no rigor to it, you know. People just understand. Now, obviously, um, a lot of people with PhDs will argue with that. You know, pe people who research into psychology and, and game design as well will argue with you. And one very interesting thing that they talk about is conditioning through consequences. I'm not sure if you guys played Farmville before. Has anyone played Farmville here? I hope not. Okay, so no one has played Farmville before. But basically, what happens in Farmville is is that you can plant your crops, okay? And different crops that you can plant uh, have different um, reward ratios. So, for example, if I plant a plant that it grows in 30 seconds. Um, I will earn uh, five points. If I plant a plant that grows for 20 minutes, that means I don't have to check the game for 20 minutes, right? Um, the minute plant is much lower. Why did the game designers do that? Think for a moment. Can you guys think of any answers? Okay. So
Okay, does anyone? What? Why do you guys think that they did this different ratio kind of thing? Okay, that's a good point. So you'll be stuck in the game. Okay, Thaddeus, you want to say something? Uh, I thought like just to give them the, like you know like a choice. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, like, yes. You know, correct. So correct. Plan out what to do themselves. Yeah. Mm. Correct. Okay. So Thaddeus talked about the point of choice, um, while Benjamin talked about how it makes you stuck in the game, and both are equally correct answers and it's something that they both want to do. So first thing, if you can plan your own um, choices, you know, for example, if let's say I'm playing a game and I have a class in, in, in two minutes and that class is going to last for one hour, I'm going to plant crops that last for one hour, even though it's worthless. Because if I'm going to plant crops that are 30 seconds, I'm not going to be able to check. Okay, I'm going to earn more money if I'm going to plant one hour. And if, to me, I feel that, you know, I'm in control of the game and I'm competent because I can plan out the game. And you know, there's a certain level of complexity to the game. If I'm going to give you all the plants that are the same, uh, then obviously the game would not be as fun. Okay, uh, and Ben shared that you know you stuck in the game. That's correct. Let's say you're someone with a lot of free time. Okay, let's say I'm free the entire day. I took leave, uh, and I can just keep planting plants that last for 30 seconds, and that would be the most uh, effective way of earning money. That means I have to sit at the computer 30 seconds at a time and watch my plants grow. And what is going to happen during those 30 seconds? If you look at Farmville, you have little icons all over the place. You see advertisements. You see prompts to buy some credits, to SMS your friends, uh, not sorry, send a message to your friends, so on and so forth. And that's why Farmville has become such an infamous example of social spamming. You know, you get everyone sends you a brown cow or something like that. Help, my dog has has fallen down the well. Save me, save me, or something like that. So um, the the reason why that happens is because people are stuck in the game and they're waiting for their crops to grow, so they want to do something else. How is this relevant for our games? It means that you must think about. Uh, Farmville is an excellent example of how people use um, the different consequences and the, the ability to, to create your own plans uh, as a way of, of, of trapping people in the game cycle. So obviously there's a certain unethical element of this. Okay, So gamification, there's always the risk of, of creating cycles that are not good. But as long as you are aware of what kind of cycles of addiction you're creating. Okay, So don't, don't mistake this. Don't, uh, don't fool yourself for a second when, when you say that you know, gamification is not creating addiction. Okay, You are creating a cycle of addiction. The question is, what is that addiction for? Okay, And one brilliant stroke that, that the, game, the Farmville people did was, if you didn't log into your game for a certain amount of time, your plants will die. What does that mean? Uh, have you heard of... Okay. Uh, have you heard of... Um, operant conditioning? Has anyone heard of that before? So the term is O-P-E-R-A-N-T, operant conditioning. And basically, uh, no, no, it's not bacteria. <laughs> um, okay, so basically op operant conditioning is very easy. It's just basically stating that uh, one very easy way of doing it is, um, I'm not very sure if you guys have watched, uh, I can't remember what show it was, Big Bang Theory. I'm not very sure. Uh, so basically in the episode, the guy uses operant conditioning to train his, his friend or his wife or whatever it is. So every time she did something nice for him, she gave, uh, he gave her a piece of chocolate. Okay? So it's giving us something um, beneficial in exchange for doing something that's good. Okay? And so basically, yeah, so uh, Ben gets that, 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 that example. Um, this is, is similar to that. So an example to give something that's positive, training Penny, is that, so is it Big Bang Theory? Yeah, okay, so it's Big Bang Theory. Uh, I, I would assume the episode is called Training Penny. Yeah, so the reverse is true as well. Operant condition also works by giving people negative um, negative consequences in exchange for uh, negative actions. Okay, so uh, this is a huge example, a huge um, huge model in, in, in behavioral psychology. That's one of the earlier ones, um, and that's something that you might want to consider in your games as well. What are some negative examples that you don't want people to do? What are some positive things you want them to do? Um, so Ben brought up Pavlov. Um, not directly relevant. Pavlov wasn't about operant conditioning. Uh, his was a, was. Oh my goodness! Okay, okay. So Pavlov, if you guys don't know about the example. What what Pavlov did is he gave um, some dogs um, food. And every time the dogs were exposed to food, he would, uh, before the dogs were exposed to food, uh, he would he would he would ring a bell. And that bell by uh, the bell by itself has no meaning for dogs. But after over time, they they came to 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 associate uh, associate the the bell ringing with with the with dinner time. So basically, there was a different model of, of conditioning. I can't remember what the name of that was uh, offhand. Um, conditioning, I'm, I'm not very sure. Yeah. 
Uh, okay, okay. Is let me see conditioning. Is is classical conditioning or Pavlovian conditioning? So that's what it's called. So if you guys are interested in, in looking at how people behave in terms of of you know the carrot and the stick, um, you can take a look at it. Okay, so uh, operant conditioning is was originated by this man called B. F. Skinner. Okay, so I'll type it down if. You, um, if you guys are interested, you can always Google. What was one of the founders of the school of operant conditioning where he got, got a rat in a cage. Um, every time the rat pressed the button, he would get a food pellet. And so the rats eventually learned to press the, the, the buttons. Okay? That's one of the basis of, of, of conditioning people. So keep these two thoughts in mind. Okay? Um, I would say the neutral, neutral stimulus one is not so relevant. Um, games ultimately use a lot of, of, um, of operant conditioning. Game, you know when you play Pac-Man, right? You know every time you eat a pellet, you get bonus point. So you are like a rat in the the, the maze at the end of the day. Okay. Um. Okay. Thanks, Mohammed, for sharing the example. So you shared another example of of um of classical conditioning. Okay. Uh. So if you guys haven't gotten an example, it's not so important. You can always read it up later. Okay. Um. Again, feedback is something that's very important. So just like I shared about oh, operant conditioning. Yeah. Correct. Correct. Uh, yeah, operant conditioning. Okay, so um, moving on, okay, we look at the importance of feedback. So I shared the LinkedIn example. You see, just this simple bar down here, you can see it on the screen. Um, made, made, I think, if I'm not wrong, 70%, made, gave a 70% increase in completion rate. And you know, that's incredible, company, considering that's so simple to do. So the question now is how can you give people uh, feedback um, in real life games? Obviously, you can't have a progress bar floating over the head. So think about some examples, uh, think about ways in which in which you can do it. So obviously this is a workshop. I'm not going to make you guys think about it now because we have limited time, but keep this in mind. Okay, feedback is extremely, 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 extremely important. If you have a break in your, your game cycle, then obviously it's not a cycle anymore and people are not going to play as well. Okay, Debriefing is another important point. Obviously you need to debrief people. Um, so tying things together. Okay, Good games trigger people to do certain things effectively. Okay, And so with the two loops we talked about just now, the engagement loop, the engagement loop which was judgment, behavior, feedback, and that creates motivation. No motivation, people stop playing a game. Next thing is your progression loop. It gives people the sense of a perceived ability because as you level up in the game, as you do tasks that are within the flow, uh, and you are in the flow, um, you feel that you have a sense of competence. Okay? And that's very important. So you see these two things are tied into self-determination theory very well. Okay? You have these two things, chances are your game will be more likely to succeed. So, so far, I haven't give you, given you guys uh, the nitty-gritty of how to create games. Okay, So now we're going to spend some time talking about how to create it. So uh, this is not very important. You ask these are some learning outcomes you can achieve through games. Not so important. You can skip. Uh, let me find that. That slide first. OK. Uh, uh, over justification. OK, so this is something that I would like to share with you guys first. Okay, So um, when you talk about real life events, Chances are you would see you know people offering you know lucky draw prizes or trophies or money. That's all well and good. Okay. So when you think about prizes, okay, um, rewards, um, it's a way of, of 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 giving people positive feedback, correct? Okay. But one thing you have to be very careful about is making sure that the reward doesn't substitute for intrinsic motivation. And what is the main pool of intrinsic motivation for people? I would say it's fun and and you know fun and the social element of it. Okay, so the self-determination theory creates intrinsic motivation. If you feel competent, you feel autonomous, and you feel that you're related to the people around you, you have an intrinsic motivation to do something. Whereas if, let's say, I'm going to say, okay, Ben, uh, I need to do a, do a task, and, and you know, it's something that you intrinsically enjoy. Chances are you, do the, you take on the task well. But now I'm going to tell you, Ben, can you please help me go clear out? Okay, so the example, let's say Ben really loves clearing out garbage, la. loves digging through trash and throwing it away. Um, I, I, uh, okay, maybe let's give a good, better example. So Ben is involved in, let me show you a picture of Ben so you guys know who I'm talking about. Okay, so Ben is involved in, in something called uh, the NUS REC and every year what happens at REC is that you know they collect garbage and they build amazing structures out of it. Okay, so um, people spend months of hours and hours and hours of time, uh, hours and hours on end um, building all these structures. It's not exactly easy to build and they're sweating away in the heat, uh, throwing away their whole holidays to build structures that return on one day. A lot of these people are intrinsically motivated to it. For one, for the pride of the faculty, others maybe because their friends are there and they enjoy doing the, th the thing. So a lot of people like Ben are driven, 
because of the intrinsic motivation to do things. Okay, so Ben, I would say, uh, feels very driven to do it. But now, let's say I told you, Ben, I'm gonna give you, um, I'm gonna give you ten cents for every day that you spend building all the things there. Chances are, uh, along the way, if, uh, maybe not Ben because Ben loves Rack so much. But maybe some people who are involved in Rack right now might start saying, you know, the actions I spend here, one day is only worth ten cents. Why don't I do something that's worth more money? I could go work at McDonald's and earn six dollars, seven dollars an hour. Why should I stay here? So that's the, the that's that's called the over justification effect. So be very careful when you give people prizes. So extrinsic rewards are are good in luring people in, but don't overdo it. Okay, so that's something that I want you guys to keep in mind as well. All right, if you can bring people intrinsic motivation, that's why I'm focusing so much on how do you get people to uh, how do you make your games adhere to the self determination theory uh, concepts. Uh, it's because uh, it's because of that. Yeah, so some examples, people sh there are a lot of research done on this. Um, so for example, there were a bunch of kids who love drawing. Uh, eventually, the, the researchers said, okay, for every drawing you do, we're going to give you like cookies or money or something like that. Eventually, saw the the number of kids drawing went down, uh, and that's because uh, that's because you know the kids started associate. Oh, there was the over justification fact. Okay, so that's just like uh, you know this one big warning for you. Yeah, I apologize if the, the whole structure hasn't been very clear so far. Um, okay, so um, do you guys have any questions before I go into the details? Yes, no. Sorry I'm move if I'm moving a bit fast. Uh, yes, uh, so Ben said whether it's like some kind of crowding out effect. In a sense, it is a crowding out effect. Um, the main thing here is that you are telling people your 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 sense of self worth is only worth ten percent. Correct. So basically, this external motivation replaces the initial intrinsic motivation of doing things. Certainly, so let's say if let's say I'm using a rack example again, I'm going to tell you Ben, the time you spend with your friends is only worth ten cents. It might sound ludicrous at the moment, right? But over time, you will get used to that. You know, it's just like you know, so who cares about my friends? I want to earn more money. Yeah, okay, yeah. So you'll take the ten cents and run. Oh no, okay, you won't run, you do the thing. Okay, so um, so it is in an essence a crowding out effect. Like, so um, does anyone else have, have any pointers to make at this point? Am I going too fast, too slow, uh, too boring? No? Okay, so now we'll just go through our final component. Okay? So this is the final component. Um, it's basically how to design games. And there's this um, theory out there that's called the four keys. To fun created by XEO Design, I think if I if I remember correct. Okay, so basically I shared with my co team previously. Um, what basically this this uh, this model says is that you know in order for people to 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 have fun. Okay, so why am I talking about fun now? Okay, so you notice a lot of things that I talked about earlier were all very dead things. Okay, motivation is not not does not necessarily equal to fun. Games do not necessarily equal to fun. But ultimately. Uh, a huge draw of intrinsic motivation. What motivates people intrinsically is also fun, and people come to expect games to be fun. So how do you make your game fun? Um, this model basically says that in order to, to, to make your game more successful, you have more uh, you have more components of fun here. So they've broken now fun into four components. You have hard fun, which they call fiero. Um, hard fun basically refers to things like challenge and requires skill. So for example, if I'm fighting a really difficult boss and I lose, or the escape room example, I lose this game. Um, a huge draw of the, the escape room is because it's very difficult. And if I win it, I can take a picture of myself, you know, upload to friends, uh, upload to Facebook, um, and show to my friends, you know, I, I conquered this thing and I, I feel very proud of myself. I have conquered something. And that's one thing that people find fun. Next thing is easy fun, which is talking about um, things like, you know, talking about things about curiosity, the novelness of a, the, I don't even think that's a word, novelty. Of, of the game scenario. So for example, in Assassin's Creed, or even, okay, let's talk about the, the, the escape room again, because you're facing a new scenario with new elements, new storylines, uh, new sensations being uh, uh, new sensations being created. Uh, you enjoy yourself, you're exploring a whole new world, and that's something you like. Okay. The next point is serious fun. And serious fun is basically um, talking about the excitement of collecting things um, so all humans have a have an intrinsic need to to hoard stuff, lah. So you know there are there's you know not every single site in the world has like badges and things that you want to create. So if you play Pokemon in the start, right, one of the motivations to to, to Pokemon was what what was the catchphrase of Pokemon? Does anyone know? Yeah, gotta catch them all. That's a good answer, Ben. 
Pokemon, the answer was that their catchphrase was got to catch them all. 151 Pokemon, catch them all. And that was a big draw for people. Collection, um, serious fun is another element that, that is very, fun, uh, very enjoyable as well. And the final one, of course, is people fun. You play it because you enjoy the time with the people. So the, um, let me go back to my World of Warcraft example. Um, for a long time, I, I, I played the game a few years. Then there was one point where you know I was struggling my studies. Uh, I knew that actually I quit the game, but I didn't quit the game because uh, my guildmates, so in World of Warcraft, you have guildmates who play with you, you go on raids together every night, and you know, these people were my friends, and I felt bad uh, ditching them, and I, I, yeah, I felt bad ditching them, so, you know, I stayed on the game for an extra, like, two months, three months, and, you know, that two months, three months meant, like, well, $50 extra for the for the company creating the game, right, so, these are four keys of fun, keep that in mind, um, you can always refer to it, okay, so, you notice in this game workshop, I'm introducing a lot of, of, of theories and all that. I don't expect you guys to memorize everything. Uh, the slides are there. They will be uploaded. I'll give you guys the, the link to it. Uh, and you guys can can always refer back to this, okay? And then we'll end this, this, sorry. We'll end this workshop by going through some mechanics that you can use, uh, some specific examples of things that we can do uh, in order to create a game and for the for my Code Blue team, team to get you guys, your brains rolled, not your brains rolling, your ideas rolling I'll give you guys some examples of you know how can we use it directly for for Code Blue as well, okay? So um, and finally, before we go off, I'll share you guys a uh, 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 framework. Um, I'm not sure if I have it here today. Uh, okay, well, I'll share you guys a framework um, on that guides you to guides you on how to how to uh, create your own gamified system, okay? And and that that, that framework is 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 um, was created by this guy you can see over here. This guy is an incredible guy. I learned all I knew about gamification from his online course. His name is Kevin Werbach, I think, from the University of Pennsylvania. And if you guys are interested, you can always check out his Coursera course. Okay, on Coursera. I'll put the link in, in the description as well. Okay, so this is the pyramid of, of things that you can have, okay? And this pyramid, you see three different layers, okay? So this is the last point we're going to go through, okay? Components, mechanics, and dynamics. And this is what makes up a game. Uh, all these three points are created, uh, are joined together by the whole experience of things, and experience is usually created by aesthetics. Okay, it doesn't make a lot of sense now. Let's go to the details. So components are the specific things that you see in games: points, uh, badges, leaderboards. Okay, mechanics are essentially what drives all these things, and dynamics are the higher level things. Okay, so essentially, for a successful game to, to go ahead, you should have a lot of components, several mechanics, and several dynamics as well. Okay, if you miss out the dynamics and you just use components. So, for example, if I create a first aid game with only one component of it, this I'm saying, okay, so you can play first aid. Every time you do one chest compression for CPR, right, I'm going to give you one point. Who's going to care? Who's going to play the game? It's not going to be fun at all because I have no mechanics driving it. I have no dynamics uh, bringing the game together and no experience to tie it together. Okay, so let's start from the lowest level, um, components. So components are the specific instant, uh, specific instant, I can't even read that word, specific Mechanics and dynamics, okay, they are the nouns. So you have things like achievements, avatars, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so let me give you some examples. So achievements, uh, using yourself of Code Blue, how can you put uh, uh, achievements in the game? Obviously, things like, you know, um, your post-game photos, you know, I've conquered the Code Blue challenge, and you can take a photo, put it on Facebook. You know, that's something that a lot of people do. Avatars, you know, you want to put up flags and all kind of stuff. Okay, so I'm just going to, do. okay, just look through this list. Um, do you guys have any questions about this? I mean, it's pretty straightforward. Does anyone have any questions about all these? So this is like a cheat sheet. You can always have a check this as you create your game. Every time you insert a certain component of the game into it, you can take it off, and you know you know they've done something extra. Um, okay, let's get your brains rolling. Um, who wants to answer? Okay, anyone can answer this question. Um, can you guys think of one way of introducing... Um, uh, collections into Code Blue. Anyone? And what collections mean is basically like you know badges. You want to create. You want to collect as many badges as you want. How about? Uh, what's answer? Hannah, would you like to answer? Or Charlotte? Okay, Charlotte, you want to answer? So. While, while she's thinking, you guys can think as well. You know, how can you inclu include collections into the thing? And collections tie together with the four keys of fun. You remember just now, um, the serious fun. Take a quiet moment.
Okay, Ben shared something. I'll, I'll talk about it later. Charlotte, are you there? Okay. Okay, sure, sure. Okay, so while Charlotte's thinking, I'll share what Ben said. So he said that, you know, as you play Code Blue, you go through the different mini quests, you collect different parts of the stretcher, and I will assume at the end you can put the stretcher together. Yeah, that works. I mean, there's an there's example that you can just anyhow throw out, but you know, I can imagine it happening and people enjoying it along the way. And that, that stretcher at, long, at the end, maybe you could use it for, for saving someone at your final boss battle or whatever it is, and you collect everything, then you win extra points. Why not? See, on a whimsy, Ben has come up with a, with a component that's really useful. Uh, you guys might want to consider as well. Okay, so Charlotte has said that uh, maybe through the different stations that play. Okay, so Code Blue, I'm imagining it as several different stations along the way uh, where they learn first aid. They'll gain first aid supplies and ultimately um, those first aid supplies can be used to treat, uh, for, to let them do a final treatment or something at the end. You know, that's brilliant because Charlotte has given ex two examples of components here in her, in her, her, her you know, her last minute thrown out idea. Uh, so for example, the collection element here is that you know they're collecting different parts of the first aid kit, and that first aid kit can be used to treat a, a final condition or whatever it is. And that's essentially your boss fight, and that's an excellent example. Uh, Mohamed also said that you know this collection can be unrelated to first aid. Um, I mean, by all means, it's fine. Uh, a lot of, of times when you when you do things, it doesn't doesn't necessarily have to be related to first aid. Um, so one example I can give of collections is let's say along the way, um, additional things you know you have hidden objectives. So along the, let's say you you do something special along the, you do the, something special, you gain a bonus item like a badge or whatever it is, and at the end of it you can show off your badge. Um, I can't think of anything good at the moment. I think Ben's, Mohamed's, and and Charlotte's idea is much better. Okay, so you guys did a great job. You can see very easy to come out with game components, and this is the baseline of all games. Okay, so let's let's move forward. Um, we're almost at the end. Let's press on. Okay, mechanics. Mechanics are the processes that drive the action forward, or the verbs. Okay, so basically you have your components there. Uh, without without anything moving those those components, it's like you're having a toolbox but without a builder. Okay, does that make sense? So your your mechanics are your tools. You have your hammer, your 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 screwdriver, whatever it is. But if you don't have the guy come and pick it up, there's no point. Okay, so what drives the thing forward? Challenges, chance, competition, cooperation, feedback, resource acquisition, rewards, transaction, terms, and say. Obviously, not all of this can be uh, will be relevant. Um, but if you can include as much as possible, chances are your game will be more fun and more enjoyable. You have increased intrinsic motivation as well. Okay, so one very important thing that I want to stress for this slide is just win states. Okay, just now I shared something about you know you have clear rules and objectives. So if you have clear rules and objectives, you will need a win state. Uh, the the timeless games we have of our time, you know, like uh, chess, uh, Monopoly, whatever it is, all of them have a win state, and it's very very clear. So you cannot have something that's so wishy washy, and then it's not a game already. Okay, the last thing that we have is the dynamics. What is the big picture aspects? You know, what is the underlying currents of the game? What are the constraints they have? So what are the rules that they have to play by? What are the emotions that evoked? You know, when you play a game like uh, Assassin's Creed, right, you feel a deep connection to the character. When someone dies uh, in-game, in your emotions are pulled as well. You know? So what are the emotions you're trying to create? What's your narrative? What's your storyline? What is the progression that you make through the game? And what are the relationships you form? You know, these are all very human elements. And this appeals to the relatedness of the of the person. You know, coming back to self-determination theory again. You know, what's the relatedness that they have? Um, and you know, if you are able to use all these things to drive your story forward. So in, in this example, the analogy I gave from the tools, right? So your 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 components are your tools, your mechanics are the are the person are the, is the builder, but the dynamics is what motivates the person the, the, the what motivates the, the builder to wake up every day in the first place. Okay? He wakes up because he loves his wife, he wants to take care of his kids, he wants to raise funds so they can go to university, all that kind of stuff. Okay? So that's your big picture grammar. And everything of course is tied together by aesthetics. Okay? Aesthetics um, is a bit harder to create in real life because you don't have like you know, graphic designers to create like fantastical creatures out of nowhere. But if you can uh, include aesthetics into your story, into your game, then you know that's a big bonus as well. Okay? Um, the rest of the things are, are not so important. <coughs> Sorry, I'm losing my voice. Um, okay, so maybe this last, uh, not last one, okay. Um, 
make sure everything else is not so important. Here's some some uh, examples. So you know what things are fun. Ask yourself what's fun as well. Um, and then that's basically it. Okay. So um, I'm gonna include a, a slide later uh, or, or, or a link later that shares about how to how to go about creating your first game fight event. Um, for the Cold Blue team, I think I've shared it on Facebook before, but I'll share it again. Um, but basically, the steps you have to walk through is you know pinpoint what your objective is. So maybe not a business, but you know what is your objective for us, Cold Blue. Um, what do you think the motivation is? Anyone share share what you think it is? So we we talk about it at the start. Now we can share a bit again. Yeah, anyone, anyone can answer the That is? Yeah, it's basically to improve people's awareness of first aid and increase their, you know, their interest, right, in learning more about it. Mm. Yeah, so that it becomes a more active process instead of like a school feeding kind of thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if we work from that objective, uh, I think you summarized it quite well. We want to motivate people to learn first aid, you know, um, yeah, to motivate people to learn first aid. That's our objective. And then therefore, we can identify what behaviors you want. So, what does the behavior sound familiar to you guys? What was the what was the, the mechanic or what was the theory that I shared just now that talked about user behaviors? It's the game cycle. Okay, you guys remember the game cycle. Yeah. So the user behavior here. Okay. So now we've identified. You know what's our instructional content. Now we want to no, no we identify what our learning outcomes are. Now we want to identify what the behaviors uh, we want them to achieve. Okay, so think about yourself. Uh, so for example, in, in the terms of 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 code blue, what's the behaviors we want them to do? Uh, for example, we want them to try their hand out as some basic first aid. You know, and and because of that, they, they feel that they enjoy themselves. And after you choose the rewards that you want to give to the people, uh, for example, do you want it to be intrinsic reward or an extrinsic? Uh, reward. They want it to be like just some prize, you know, you give them like a goodie bag with, with sweets or something inside. Or do you choose something that's more interesting motivation? They enjoy doing it. The reward is is, is the sense of, of you know helping other people, uh, of, of of mastering the skill, whatever it is. Okay? Now after you choose your game mechanics, which is the pyramid again, you know, your components, mechanics, dynamics, everything up there. And then use analytics to track. Okay, so this is a very important point. In gamification, you can't go in blind and just say, you know, oh, gamification is great because I have some examples uh, that will surely blow your mind. Okay, so analytics are a very important component. Okay, we must do surveys in real life um, to see that, you know, I have uh, a reason to show that, you know, why I use games in the first place in our conventional methods. Okay, so I know it's been a bit long, about an hour long, um, and you guys have been a very good group. I hope you guys learned something. Uh, I'm going to stop the broadcast in a while. Okay. Uh, but I would like to show you guys something first, okay? Um, the bro stop broadcast doesn't mean the, the meeting stop. <laughs> okay, let me show you guys one last thing, okay? So um, this is something that I'm trying out. Um, if you guys uh, want to do it for your own projects as well, by all means, you can go ahead, okay? Yeah, Minecraft, okay? So a big part of... Oh my goodness, why is it dark? Uh, that's horrible. Okay, a big part of... of, 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 um, of what am I even saying anymore? Okay, let me show you guys. Okay, so basically this is supposed to be a model of, of the venue they want to do. Um, obviously it's not complete. So if you guys don't know, recognize this, this is supposed to be the bus stop of University Town at NUS. Okay, you can see the bus stop. You walk into here. Woo! That's great. And then I can walk out. Oh, there's the bus stop. And then oh, this leads somewhere. Their plants are here. So and so forth. Obviously it's not complete. This was all just built from memory. Okay? Yeah, I just built it. Not too long ago. So uh, what we're gonna try out, okay? If you guys want to do it, and Mohammed was quite excited about it the other day, uh, yesterday, uh, is we can use this as a as a way of of you know planning out our our, our events as well. You know, you have the the statue, you have the whole venue over there. You can put where your games will be. Um, you can put um, anything. You can put anything anywhere. And, you know, people can. Oh no, I destroyed my own place. <laughs> you can put anything anywhere, uh, and you know everyone will be able to understand again. So this is an example of a prototype. Okay, so games this is a good way. Okay, we can try it out. If you guys want, and uh, we can see. Um, for you guys who are watching at home, you can try this out also. Uh, it might be useful. Okay, so you can fly anywhere. You can destroy things. Okay, so eventually this will be Utah. Excellent. There are some pigs and cows over there. Okay, so uh, 
what I'll do for Code Blue as well is you know after after this when I figure out how to how to how to um, share with you guys, then we can create this world together. Um, so it'll be you'll be able to be, be, be able to better understand you know what's what what goes where. You know, one big problem about real life games is you don't know what the heck is going on, where it goes what goes everywhere, and your volunteers don't know. So if they don't go walk the ground, okay. So this is an alternative to walking the ground. It's a good UA of using. It, okay, so that's just an interesting way. It's not very important to this event, uh, to this workshop. Oh, let's quit this game, save and quit. Okay, let's go back. Oh, how do I go back? Okay, so that ends our broadcast. Okay, so you can check the link descriptions later uh, for my community up on Facebook. Okay, uh, and then you guys can see as well. Okay, so um, I'm gonna end the broadcast now. Okay, so if you guys have any questions, just leave it on our Facebook page. Okay, bye.